Sunday night. So you know what that means. Welcome to the Garage Apartment. Sports and entertainment with your favorite partners, favorite partners. I am the Funky Militant, the Dark Jones. And as always, I got the tribe with me. Let them know who you are. Got that boy, Mom Little up in here. D, you second. Oh, I'm bad. D, Max, <laughs> back and better than ever. And my. With our special guest. Wait, we're gonna get to him in just a second. Whoa. Yes, indeed. We're here each and every Sunday night from 6 to 7 Central Standard Time. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And check out our new website, thegarageapt.com. Of course, you can hit us up, 713-489-0688. Is it what was that again? Four, oh, oh God. 489 <laughs> Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Got a very, 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 very special guest in there tonight. Yes, sir. One that I'm very proud of. Texas kid. We were just talking before we went on there, letting us know straight out the hood. Knew he was coming back. NFL Pro Bowler, Mr. Wade Smith. Hey. Yeah, yeah, we ain't got no studio audience, but we're gonna clap it up for him. Clap it up for Clap it up for Clap it up. So, hey, may I say, a slender, a much slender yeah. way like Smith. Yeah, knocking too much. <laughs> but it's amazing Still how that knock happens, you the F out, them arms is, hey, oh, yeah. them biceps. I'm always amazed when I see an offensive lineman, and they all seem to do it. Like, is it, is it that much work keeping it on? Um, it seems like it falls off incredibly. Well, well, for me, see, when I was in high school, I played tight end. Right, and I got recruited by Memphis to be a tight end, and I was a tight end and fullback at Memphis for two years, and I was like 245, 250 when I was there. So I moved to tackle um, going into my junior year, so I started gaining weight then. And so I was like, my senior year, I was 270 pounds. So oh, okay. that's about, so, like, I'm like 265 right now. So okay. I made it to the league, you know, gained a bunch of weight, and I, I kept the weight on. Because I was it, just getting ready to it, ask you that. So. You say you walking around at 265. What was your playing weight in the NFL? Uh, like when I was here with the Texans, I was like 305. So you had to like really put effort in to eat and maintain that weight, or is you, you just. I didn't have to put effort into it. I just got to eat what I wanted to eat when I wanted to eat it. Right. You know what I mean? Now I don't. I try not to eat late okay. at night. You know what I mean? I, I kind of tone back the way I used to function when I played. When I played, you know, it's steak dinners all the time. It's, right. You know, O line dinners and all that type of stuff. I get, used to eat whatever I wanted as long as I worked out. Right. Um, I was good. You know what I mean. So, but what were you supposed to report to camp at? I they never gave me a weight. You okay. know what I'm saying? Like I because I was one of those guys that you know. There's certain guys that that might be undersized, and so they try to make sure that they're at at least like 290. Like right. like Chris Myers was a guy that they had like a minimum weight on Chris. Right. right. But then other guys, older, I mean, like bigger guys, they might say, you know, you need to come in at 325. And so guys were trying to cut weight to get to that weight, you know what I mean, um, each and every week. But I was never one of those guys. I was just like, shoot, I ate what I wanted to eat, and I'd be 305, 300 pounds, somewhere in between there, and I was good. So I never really – I mean, they would give me a weight, but the strength coaches didn't really care because they understood that I knew what I needed to be at in order to play and be successful. Right. So Right. Yeah. So how much of a difference do you feel now? How much do you notice now? Um, I mean, towards the end of my career, man, like I used to have to make a conscious decision. Did I want to go upstairs or not? Because my knees were used to be so, okay. so bad, okay. you know what I mean? So like walking up and down stairs now is no thing, right. you know what I mean? But it used to be like I had to make a decision. Like, is it, is it really that important, whatever I need upstairs? <laughs> or am I going to send somebody up there to get it for me? Because it used to hurt to walk up the stairs and down the stairs. Oh, you know what man. I mean? That's part of the reason why I ended up. Huh? Just time just made it get better, or the losing well, weight. Well, losing the weight helped a lot. Uh, not having that that constant pounding of you know being an offensive lineman in the NFL, man, it's 
it's stressful in your body, and so it's like a car wreck um, every every play, huh? Oh, it's yeah. like a what? Well, some a lot of times, yeah. But mm -hmm. even not, even when you're not even hitting people, it's still it's a it's a it's, it's a constant pounding on your knees, just pass setting, coming off the ball, all the different things that you have to do, even if you're working against air. So uh, once you retire, you're not doing a lot of that stuff anymore. You're not squatting heavy anymore. It's a lot of things you can do to kind of. Um, wean yourself off of that that lifestyle, and so it, it's better for your body. So uh, when they uh, okay, so it was your junior year at Memphis when they moved you to O line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So when they told you you wasn't gonna be able to run pass routes no more and catch the ball and have a possibility to yeah. score a touchdown. Yeah. How long did it take you to get over that mentally and say, I'm just going to do what the coach wants me to do and maybe you know it's what? best for me? That's a great question because, see, this is the thing. My first two years in college, um, if y'all remember the Texans back in the day they had, and I say back in the day, but it was about six, seven years ago, they had two tight ends. They had Owen Daniels and they had Joe Dreesen. Right. And so I was like, and ran, we ran pretty much the same offense that the Texans ran when I was at Memphis. So I was like Joel Dreesen. So I was the second tight end. Okay. I started a bunch of games, but if we started with two tight ends, I was the second guy. Well, the first tight end, he graduated and went to the league after after my sophomore year. So now it was my time to be the guy. <laughs> to be you know the number I mean? one guy. You started right. every game. Yeah. So I, and then I was going to get all the majority of the passes. Passing, I caught only like six passes my whole career um, before I moved to tackle. But uh, what happened was is that our coach got fired. Rip Shear was my coach that re re recruited me. He's like a quarterback's coach now with the Chargers or the Rams now. But um, he recruited me, and I was a tight end. Then Tommy West came, and he was the head coach. And he, he was our defensive coordinator. He, he brought me in the office. He said, hey, we're about to change offenses. Y if y'all remember back in that, those times, that's when the spread offense just came into yeah. to play, right? right, right so right. we went from that Gary Kubiak, two tight ends, yeah. one single back, two, you know, that offense, to now we run the four wide receivers, five wide receiver sets all the time. And he was like, if you stay a tight end, you might play 15, 20 snaps a game. Right. And he's like, you too good to do that. So you need, you're either going to move to D-line or you're going to move to O-line. And he, he brought me in his office. This is like right before spring break. You know what I'm saying? So I'm getting ready to go home. I'm excited about going home. I'm about to go back to Dallas, you know. And sure enough, he brings me to the office and he tells me that. And I'm like, my first thought is like, well, damn, where am I going to transfer? Right, right, right. You know what I mean? That was my first thought. Um, and I went back to my he, – and he, he gave his little talk. He said, you know, you know, you can play defensive line for us. You can play offensive line. He's like, if you play offensive line for us, two years from now, you'll be one of the most athletic uh, tackles in the draft. And but still in my mind, I'm like, you know, I'm I'm, I'm supposed <laughs> to be the man that tied in now. So, but I went back to my uh, my dorm room and my my roommate at the time, his name is Jamon Pugh, uh, my guy. He uh, he was uh, our starting center and he was the captain, one of our captains on the team. And he said, "Hey man, I told him what happened." He said, "Bro, dog, you need to move the O line, dog." He was like, "If you move the O line, you'll be good at that." I'm hold on. Can I, what, what kind of uh, what kind of language can I use on this show? Man, you good. Yeah, we internet, we internet ready. No, okay. you, you good So he'd be like, you was good at that shit. So I was, yeah, like, yeah. Good at and I was like, all right. I was like, that's a bit. And I was like, I went home, talked to my mom about it or whatever. But when he told me that, I was like, all right, let me, uh, let me, uh, let me give it a shot. You know what I'm saying? And so that first day, because we came back with spring football. So I came back. And sure enough, we started practicing and stuff. And that first day, I loved it. I love I love the O line room. I love the camaraderie. I loved everything about it. It was different when you when you were tight end in college. It was like three or four guys in a room, and you had your one coach. When you go to the O line room, it's like 15, 20 guys in there. You got all those different personalities, and you got a bunch of guys that are in the room that don't get shine. You know what right, I mean? Right, that right. whole Absolutely. mentality is to make sure somebody else shines. Absolutely. Right. And I, I I fit right into that when I when, like. I went to high school at Lake Highlands High School in Dallas. We ran the wishbone. So yeah. even though I was a tight end there, I'm you blocking were blocking every third tackle. Three yards yeah. and a cloud yeah. of dust. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> led the team in pancake blocks, all that stuff Damn. in the tight end position. So right. I had that mentality anyway. So moving the O-line, it wasn't that much of a stretch. And I think that's something that the, the, the head coach, Tommy West, saw, my, my roommate saw as well. Because even when I was the second tight end, I was like, I also play H back, so I would lead block, and, right. and a lot of times when we ran the ball, we ran the ball my way. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it ended up working out good, man. Tommy West knew what he was talking about. I ended up getting, you know, drafted in the third round yeah. as one, and I went to the combine. I was one of the most athletic tackles at the combine and in the draft, and so it ended up working out. Yeah. So before Tommy tells you, when do you know? All right, I got a shot at the NFL. Yeah. That's a great question. So 
my first two, like when I made it to when I when I came out of high school, my whole thought process was I need to get a scholarship so I could go to school. Because if I don't get a scholarship, my mom not gonna be able to um, send me to school. Right. I have to go to community college or right. something like that. So that was my thoughts in like my junior year, senior year in high school. Then after I uh, got my scholarship, I made it to the to the school. My thought was like I'm gonna get my scholarship, I'm gonna get my degrees, and start a business. That was my thought process. It wasn't I'm gonna go to Memphis so I can go to the NFL. Right. Um. It just that what that my my thought even process walking wasn't around like that. at your size. I mean, of course I, I you was, know you had the size. I, I was normal size. I was six four, two forty five as a tight end. That ain't that ain't nothing crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but, it's, uh, it's walking with the average man, that's a big man. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I, that was my thought process. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go to school and and get my degree and and start a business. That was right. my whole thought process. Well, then I started playing and I started seeing guys that was that was my teammates making it to the NFL. Right. And I was like, well, shoot, if he can make it, I can make it. Like, well, see, I know I'm better than him. <laughs> and, and not even that, like, I, I can play with these right, guys. Like, right, these guys right, is right. good, but I'm just as good as them. So right. if they can make it, I can make it. You know what I mean? And so that was probably, like, my sophomore year when I was a tight end. I started thinking, like, you know what, I can make it to the league as a tight end. But then when I switched to O-line, then I'm like, dang, I don't even, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. But I, I started playing, and I had a lot of success early on. Like I was doing a good job, and so I just, you know, I just kept grinding it out, and I, I figured if, you know, if I if I handle what I need to handle, um, in the classroom, weight room, I was always a hard worker, mm -hmm. then I'd get a shot, and that's the whole thing. I just wanted to get a shot, right. you know what I mean? Because like I said, I didn't go into high school, I mean, going to college with some preconceived notion that like, you know, I'm here to just to make it to the NFL. Right. And so right, this is right, like right. icing on the cake. So, right. Um, but college was never a doubt for you. Like, you're, it was, in, I'm assuming, instilled in you that you were going to go to school? Oh, no question I was going to go to school. It was just what type of school and how much of a strain on my family was, was it going to be for me to go. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, we it's a, it's, a, it's a community college like five minutes from my high school called Richland College, uh -huh. uh, Richmond Community College. And we used to call that Lake Highlands University. Because <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the people that I went to school with, they couldn't, like, afford to go to a, a big school. Um, they ended up going to Richland, and then they would go to Richland for a while and transfer somewhere. Yeah, so that was kind of my thought process. But I was, I was always, you know, the type of person that I knew I needed to get my degree and, and, and put education first. Absolutely. So now you are listening to the Garage Apartment. We are here each and every Sunday night from six to seven Central Standard Time. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website, thegarageapt.com. We got Pro Bowler Wade Smith with us. If you have any questions, hit us up, 713-489-0688. Again, 713-489-0688. So, get to college, you make it to the NFL. So, obviously, you, you, you're reaching all of your expectations, all of your goals. When do you say, okay, I'm at the highest level now. Now I want to make the Pro Bowl. Or, or was that one of your goals or were you just trying to make a team and then that just, that just happens to fall into place? Man, my first goal when I made it to the NFL was I wanted to last long enough to, to play out my first contract. Yes. So my first contract, right. I signed a four-year deal. Okay. So I was like, you know, I want to be able to play at least four years in the league. That was my first goal. My, that was my first like really attainable goal and my long-term goal was to play 10 years that was something that those coaches at memphis told me was like man if you if you if you move to offensive line you'll you'll go high you'll go high in the draft be an athletic guy and you'll play 10 years in the league that's just the type of guy you you would be and so that was my goal to play 10 years in the league Pathetic. it was never really uh it was never really you know <laughs> make it to the Pro Bowl or anything like that. I, everything was so new to me. When I came there, I, like coming from Memphis and not really having a bunch of people in front of me that kind of led the way as far as just showing me the path to, right. get, to navigate right. through the league, right. 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 I was just taking things how they came. And, uh, you know, like I said, my first goal was to, to play out my first contract. First, for, Fortunately for me, like my first year in the league, I ended up playing, starting all 16 games at left tackle and then uh, making an all-rookie team Newcomer of the year um, with the Dolphins, so right. you know I had a lot of I had some I had some ups and I had some downs my rookie year. Um, That's expected though, right? Um, yeah, but it's expected. But 
from the outside looking in, like once you in there, and from your teammates' perspective, once you in there, once you playing, you 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 just like us. And so right. if you're not performing well, right, the lease is you know, short. You gotta you gotta you gotta deal with the repercussions for that. And when you do play well, you know, I mean, you get lighter for that. But um, so yeah, there like wasn't. I said, I'm sorry, there no. wasn't that person like your roommate that was willing to like uh, trying to take you under the wing, for lack of a better term, or just looking out for you, trying to. Show you the ways, tell you the do's and don'ts, things like that. It's literally we or all fishes like, in here. Or was it like was there somebody in there like uh your boy uh uh from the dolphins that got on uh Mm -hmm. Wow, you're drawing a blank here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who are you talking about? Yeah. Uh dude from Nebraska. Oh, uh, what was his name? Nice no, talking about Incognito. Oh, talking about right. Incognito. Oh, Incognito. Oh, Incognito. Oh, what, what, had, did you? I mean, I'm sorry to step on your question. Oh no. You Were there anybody? I mean, not Hazel. only somebody that took you under your wing. Was there anybody? You're asking about Hazel, yeah. an antagonist or anything like that. Just that. Nah, it was neither one of those things. So in other words, okay, so I didn't really have somebody that took me under my wing. Um, I did have veteran guys around me that um, tried to help me, show me the way, but it wasn't. I didn't. I didn't find out like what it was like to be around an offensive lineman. It took guys under their wing until I made it to Kansas City and I played with Brian Waters, which was another oh, cat from yeah. Dallas. So like North Brian, Texas boy. Yeah. So Brian Waters. He was a tight know, end too. He was a tight end too. Yeah. <laughs> but he he went to multiple Pro Bowls. Hopefully, he eventually make it to Hall of Famer. But when I got to him, when I got there in that part of my career, that's why I saw like this is what it's like to to be a veteran guy that's established and take guys under your wing and show them the way. Um, but when I was in Miami, man, like I said, I had early success. Um, um, it wasn't until, like, midway through my season, like, I, I played against Dwight Freeney and gave up three sacks. Mm. Um, I was, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Really? So who who's your biggest opposition? Who was the one that made you go, all right, I got I, I to gotta get to work here? Um, over my career, it was, it was a bunch of different guys. Uh, I would say early on in my career when I was playing tackle, it was Dwight Freeney was a was – a, that was a rough day at the office. But it was funny, though, because that happened to me. And then, like, two weeks later, he did the same thing to Jonathan Argon on Monday Night Football. Okay. So after that, that happened, I was hey, just you didn't like, feel so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what you did. Like, yeah, look, look, look what he did to him. You know, like, he's a Hall of Famer. Look at that. Yeah, that's Jonathan Argon. You know, I'm just a rookie left tackle. You yeah, know, from yeah, Memphis, yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, man, so I, I had that. But, like, throughout my career, there's different guys that I had a bunch of battles with, like uh, Haloti Nada, uh, Richie Seymour. Uh, Vince Wilfork. Those are the three main guys that off the top of my head. We we played a bunch of times against each other. Um, I won my fair share. They won their fair share. Um, sometimes my team won. Sometimes their team won. But um, I had a lot of respect for those guys when I played them each and every week. You know, and uh, Geno Atkins. That was another guy. Uh, Geno Atkins from the from the Bengals who's still playing. Those were yeah. those are the four main guys that um, I, I felt like I knew going into those weeks that. You had to have your mind right, um, and you know it, it, it was like it was one of those matchups. It was like kind of like a marquee matchup. Like right. people, Everybody people knew that they knew that I could play, and I knew that they could play. And so those right. are the those are the those are the kind of games you look forward to. You know what I mean? When it's those type of opponents That's like that. Yeah. All right. Well, on the other side, right. who, who is, is your barbecue chicken? <laughs> <laughs> who is barbecue, who is barbecue chicken? chicken? Who? I'm, I'm, no, not no. Who's who is your favorite running back? Oh, that you like uh, that's a tough question, you. man, because I had a lot of great ones, man. Hey. I started off with Ricky Williams. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I had Ricky right. Williams, my guy Thomas Jones when I was up in New York. Okay. Um, a lot of respect for that cat. I had Jamal Charles with the Kansas City. Man. P-A-T. Yeah. Texas. And then I had Arian here. Yeah. So – um, UT, who, who you was my be... favorite? That's a great question. So if I, I'm gonna say my favorite, I'm gonna say my favorite is Jamal, and I'm gonna tell you why Jamal is my favorite because Jamal was a rookie that year, and I was back. You know, Jamal, like you say, he's from Texas. Um, when he scored touchdowns, he was hitting that Dougie. He was, <laughs> he, he was hitting the Boogie. You know what I'm saying? Like he built, he, he like he bought all into that that Dallas culture. Like that yeah, little Boogie, yeah. that's that's from like my neighborhood. All right. Like right. all them cats, you know, they came from like went to school with me and all okay. that type of stuff. So, okay. So it was always fun. Like he was a young cat and like he matter of fact, he posted a video on Twitter the other day when he retired. When he announced his retirement the other day. Yeah. And he posted a video of himself. Um, scoring like a long touchdown, and he hit the, he hit that that Dougie at the end of it, 
And I was just like, man, that used to be fun. Now, yeah. who was the best running back that I played with? It was definitely Arian, and that's my boy. That's my guy. Mm -hmm. um, but if I, I'm going to say my favorite, I'll have to say Jamal. Just from he get, he get an edge because of that reason. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, what made Arian so good? Man, Ed, Arian, had, Arian had the vision. He was, he was just silky smooth with it, man. Like, he, he never looked like he was running too hard, but he was running past people. I think he only got caught one time. Uh, one time when um, he had a long run the whole time that I was with him, and we made fun of him after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, he, uh, he, he the vision – he was smooth with it, catch the ball out of the backfield. He usually he never got tackled by the first guy. But the biggest thing with him is patience and being able to see and read the holes, um, doing a great job of reading our blocks. We had a great, great offensive line when he was there. Yeah, yeah, but he was yeah. a great running back. And so it was that's that translated to how good of an offense we had my time here with Houston. Would you say he was underrated? Because I don't think uh, he gets the do that he deserves. I personally. think the problem is is that he would call he, me a fan. He, no, I, I feel you. I think the problem is is that he didn't do it long enough. I was gonna yeah. say his, I mean? his career like, was short, and he went cushioned. undrafted, so he wasn't right. highly, highly, highly touted. Right. I right. think he didn't get the chance early. He should have got. What you think? Um, I mean, the year that I got here, I got here in 2010. So his rookie year was 2009, I believe. Okay. And so he he played like the last two games of that season mm -hmm. and right. did well, but then nobody thought the next season that he was going to be the man because they drafted Ben Tate in the second round. Yep, right. They right. thought that Ben right. Tate was going to be the guy. Right. But, like, when I was in training camp and I and I would see what he was doing, just just watching him work, and I was like, man, you know, we got us something with this, with <laughs> yeah. this, this foster kid, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And then he ended up being – Arian Foster. Yeah, he won but, me fifteen hundred dollars uh, in my fantasy league. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure he and won I a lot of, him late too. I'm, I'm sure you, he won a lot of cash. I think I might have picked him up no as a free about, agent, to be honest. Yeah, yeah because nobody would have, especially in 2010, and right. he ended up leading the, leading the league in rushing. Yeah, 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 yeah. he won yeah. a rushing rushing title crazy, that year. Yeah, I remembered him at Tennessee, but it was kind of like, is that that kid? I can't really remember yeah. him that well. Tennessee was yeah, not cause... that good. It wasn't no Jamal. But see, he was the man though. Lewis tight. And it was like, I think that's him. Is that him? He yeah. run like this, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, his, you wasn't sure. His junior year, he had a really good year, and yeah. then his senior year, he got yeah. he kind of got into the doghouse with yeah. the coaches, and yeah. so that's why he ended up going undrafted. He, he pulled his hamstring when he's running his forty, or whatever. But you know, it worked out great for the city of Houston. It worked out great for me. He helped a lot of guys' career. You Absolutely, know what I mean? like um, you know, Arian. He was just he, he was he was a different cat too. Like he's the type of cat that he's I, I like, love love back. love to debate with. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, like we'd right. be in the locker room talking whatever sports. He's a big Kobe Bryant fan. I'm a big Jordan guy, so mm -hmm. he, that was a natural you know argument. He was a big Jay Z guy. I was a big Nas guy, so it was always a, it was a natural back and forth there he too. And so um, yeah, man, like Arian, that he, he's good people first and foremost, but he was a hell of a running back. Sure. Yeah, he got a pretty good podcast going too now. Man, yeah, man. man. Yeah, he does, man. He has some, some, some good casts on there. Yeah. yeah, yeah Did y'all check out his album though? I, 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 I keep saying I'm gonna do it. I checked it out. It's no, you good. need you need to check out the album, bro. Like I, I said, I keep saying because I know bro. it's different music. It's not it's not just hip hop. It's 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 Arian Foster music. Well, <laughs> I, I'm gonna say like this. Sonically, you can tell that he put a lot into it, man. Right. Like, like he got some talented cats to where you can use live instrumentation to play his song, like it's it's good music. You right. know what I'm saying? Like you know how like Kanye West got his out his, his label Good Music, right, right, right. And you know Kanye is known for his production. Like some of the production value was very very well done, man. And I, I cool. thought he, I thought he did a really good job. Because he's a self taught musician, right? Um, as far as I know, yeah. I, I believe so. I don't think he went to like you know. We not gonna avoid like this question, Wade. <laughs> Who was barbecue yeah, chicken, like man? Yeah. Who was barbecue chicken? <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. Most of, the cat, most of the cats that was like that, you don't remember those. Ah, uh, like seriously, they don't last. <laughs> like, long. They don't last long. You know what I mean? You know, it ain't gonna be too many guys that you just pick on consistently that you get op keep getting opportunities to pick on those guys. Right. Especially at defensive tackle, they get they get they get, <laughs> get them up out of there. Well, who were they hyping up, and then you got them and was like, man, get out of here. Man, I'd have to think about that. Who who would they hype up? That I got to. Um, I remember. I remember in. I remember in college playing against Albert Hainsworth. Mm. And uh, <laughs> what was the other guy from Tennessee? It was two cats from Tennessee. Yeah, it, was him, it was two cats from Tennessee that I made money off of. Like, yeah. Because like, hey, like, hey. I went to Memphis, so it was like, I'm with you. when I got an opportunity to play against them. 
you know, that's a good film. So right, right, guys right, can see that and be right. like, oh, well, okay, he, he, he did this against these guys from Tennessee. He, you know, maybe he got something. So I remember that. But, like, I remember playing against Ndamukong Sue. And I, you know, I did, I did well against Ndamukong Kinsu, but he still was a, a, a damn good player. He was a great player. I just had success against him. You know what I mean? So, but I, I can't think of anybody really that that people just would hype up, and then I got to him and be like, man, it's, he's sorry. Like, nah. I mean, there ain't too many cats in the league that's sorry because, like I said, if you're yeah. sorry, yeah, you're yeah, not gonna be there long at all. You're not gonna make it out of training camp, huh? Yeah, 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 no yeah, question. You're a quarterback. You know, yeah, that's what Joseph. Yeah, that, 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 no, that's a good point. Man. It's, it's some it's some bad quarterbacks that's, that's on the roster. No question about that. Because no my question. my wife is friends with Joseph and died, and that was one of the things he was saying. He's like, man, everybody in the NFL can play. He's like, everybody hit hard, even the cornerbacks. Yeah, he's like, ain't no. That's ain't my no, guy though. We on the same coaching staff for, for little league football. Man. Okay, yeah. shout yeah. out your little league yeah. football team. Yeah, man. Yeah. Sienna Stallions, man. We we there do our thing out there for being youth football league. Yes, sir. There you go. There you go. So now. You give you you do your ten years. You did what you did about did 12. twelve. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying sure you did about twelve. <laughs> no, 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 by no means. because look, them two years is important. That because uh, that's yeah. leading into my question. Yeah. When do you know you're done? Man, so I play. I, mean, I signed my four year deal with the Texans. So that was year I believe eight, nine, ten, and eleven for me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to re up with the Texans after my my contract was up contract ran out but had a new coaching staff coming in and I thought I could help with that transition here because Bill O'Brien he he came from the same coaching tree like half of my career I was with um kind of a Bill Walsh coaching tree type coach and the other half I was with a Bill Parcells mm -hmm. um and so I like Belichick so I had you know I had Herm Edwards I had Mangini you know, Todd Haley, these are right, opposites, yeah, yeah. you know right. what I mean? So I, I knew how to function in both types mm -hmm. of, of environments. And I was letting the cats know, even when that 2013 season when we went 2-14, and 14, when we was about 2-5, and 2-6, and six, I was like, listen, man, if we don't get this right, you understand that it's going to be, when they make that change, it's going to be the complete opposite, a complete 180 of what you used to. Right. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. They brought in Bill O'Brien. Uh, but for whatever reason, they didn't bring me back. And so I went on and, and went with the Eagles. And I was there, and I was a pro, so I always did my job. And, uh -huh. But it just it wasn't the same, man. And what it took each and every day to, to get ready to play, just physically, um, it, it takes a toll on you. And after you've played for such a long time, it's like, man, like on Sundays, I, you know, it would be Sunday, and I, wasn't this, I didn't have that same feeling when I'm coming out of the locker room like I normally would because – Throughout my career, it was kind of like, you know, you had to practice, you did all that stuff, and it gets you to Sunday. And when Sunday comes, there's nothing like it. There's nothing, there's nothing that you can replicate that feeling of coming out of the tunnel, you know what I mean, or getting your name called, coming out uh, of the flames or whatever at, at, at Reliant. Right. Not NRG, at Reliant. Right, you know right, I mean? right, nothing right. Like running that. NRG. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> so but, yeah, they, it just it wasn't the same anymore. And I was like, you know what, I want to move on with my life and, and, and do – other things um and be able to make sure that once i was done i could function like with my family i got four kids um i didn't want my daughters dunking on me <laughs> you know what I'm so uh yeah man so i just decided to go ahead and uh because after that i got released by the eagles like week eight um my 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 12th year and i got released and it was teams calling me like the titans is like Come on, we want, and I was like, "Nah, I'm good." I, like my agent was like, "Are you sure?" I'm like, "Yeah, man, I'm I'm good." You and think so, you would have had that feeling if you would have read up and stayed in Houston? I think if I stayed in Houston, I I think I definitely would have still been good. You know what I mean? Like, you, you gotta understand, like once you in it, and I was a Texan, you know what I mean? And we got close. We had some really good teams, man. We had teams like in 2011, if we don't lose our quarterback, that was yeah. a Super Bowl caliber team. You look right. at the talent we had on the roster. We had that type of team, and right. so. Once you, you know, I didn't want to go anywhere else. Yeah. Right. And so, like I said, me being a pro was where I would go somewhere else and try. I was basically trying to chase a ring because mm -hmm. I fell short here and they didn't they didn't offer me anything to come back. But I think if I would have stayed here in Houston, I probably would have late. I would probably stayed in the league a couple more years. You know what right. I mean? But like I said, my body was still wearing down and I didn't have that much time left. But I definitely probably would have added a year or two in my career if I stayed here. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned something uh, just now uh, about, you know, how close the Texans were a couple times yeah. and, and how good some of the teams were. Now, we always hear about parity in the NFL. So 
What do you think is the difference, you know, between like a team like New England or a team that makes the Super Bowl, a Super Bowl team, and, and, and how big is that difference even from a team like that to a team that finishes 1-15? and 15? Well. And, like, then, and then a team that just makes the playoffs. Like what's the difference between those tiers? So, okay, so the, the New England Patriots, they have Tom Brady. So that's the difference between a lot of teams. That they play. They is got he Tom Brady. really that good, man? Yeah, he's, he's really that good. He's really that <laughs> he's good. Been, he, like, Mind you, now I came in the league. I played for the Miami Dolphins. So I had to see him twice a year, yeah. like, every year. Yeah. So I played for the Dolphins, and then I played for the Jets. So right. So I saw him twice. So a this year is no hype. Five, you know, it's not hype at all. Like, not at all. Like, I, I, don't I, I see there was plenty of times where I'm sitting on the sideline just watching him pick pick our team apart and, and bring them back and win ball games. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, he's just that good. I mean, he's arguably the greatest quarterback of all time, and, and I can't even be mad at him. Like, I used to hate him when I played because he just – he always would find a way. No athletic ability, but has the best pocket presence of any quarterback to ever play the game. Right. You know see, what I mean? What so, you saying that, I, I got to accept it now. No, it's the I'm truth. like, you, you was the out truth. there. You, like you said, you faced him. Just, you played against yeah. him. Yeah. And, so and the teammate, his teammates knew that too. So you got to understand what kind of confidence that yeah, gives you yeah, right. as yeah. a teammate. You know that we're never out of a ball game, ever. Think about this. It was 28-3. to 3, The Falcons was up on the, yeah, yeah, on, on the Patriots yeah. in the Super Bowl. Yeah. You not, you know, you play that game 100 times, 99, 99 times, you lose that game. the Falcons going to win that yeah. game. But you know what? They had Tom Brady, and they found a way to win the game. Yes, they you know did, what I mean? so that, um I'm trying to remember what, what, what was the, the original part of well, the question. No, no, what's no, the no. difference well, in the yeah, levels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the levels. Like, yeah. The, yeah. Well, you first got of the top all, tier of those teams yeah. that win the division. A lot of difference is, you know, how is the organization run? Mm -hmm. Like, are are the the coaches and the management on the same page? Because a lot of teams bring in really good talent, but how do you get the best out of your talent on your roster? Because everybody pretty much has an even playing field on the type of talent Man. you have on your roster. But what type of scheme are you running? And is, are the, the scouts and the GM and all that type of stuff, are they bringing in the guys that fit this scheme correctly? You know what I mean? First of all, is your scheme legitimate? Can it work in this league? If it can, all right. Do you have the players? All right, cool. Are you, do you stay healthy throughout right. that season? Do you can you can you stay healthy at the key positions to keep you um, able to compete and beat the best of the best teams? Like in 2011, we had too many key injuries. We lost yes. our starting quarterback. We lost Mario Williams, who right. had five sacks in five games that year. He right. was starting off uh, outside linebacker that year. Right. Um, who else we lost? The most of that year, Dre was out. He he probably played like. I don't know, like six games or something like that. He was in and out of the lineup. Arian was in and out of the lineup. But, like, Arian had a, over 1,000 yards. Ben Tate had 900 and, like, 50 yards rushing, you know, that year. That's how good of a team we had. But we had just too many key injuries, and that was the difference between us going to the Super Bowl and falling short. Because think about it. We, we played the Ravens on the road in the playoffs. Offensive line, defensive line, we served them boys. Right. Like, and that, that was – the Ravens' defense back then – was legit, legit. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, and, a and gold we gold standard of league. No question. And we dominate. Just yeah. go back and watch the tape. It's crazy. Like they cussing each other out right. in between plays because we know what they're gonna do before they do it. Uh -huh. And we line up and do what we do, and they can't stop it. Right. Um, but we turn the ball over four times yeah. in the playoff games on the road. Yeah. You, you'll never you win, win that game. You don't win a game. We lost a game by a score. So I would say what was yeah. a touchdown? Was, yeah, yeah, it was twenty to thirteen. We breaking. had the ball. We had the ball driving late like in the yeah, game. Yeah. Breaking on that side. We just so know, luck plays a big role too. In a way. Yeah, luck is a big deal with it. The teams that go one and fifteen, stuff like that. That's a that's a total collapse of everything. Yeah, like it's 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 almost like. Um, Murphy's Law, like anything that can go wrong will. That's what happened in 2013 here with the Texans. Mm -hmm. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. We started the season 2-0. and um, We lost. I'm trying to remember who we lost in that third game. I think it might have been the Ravens on the road. But we lost that ball game. We came back home. We were playing against Seattle. We dominated that ball game. Mind you, Seattle won the Super Bowl that year. Yes. We dominated that ball game. Oh, yeah, that's the pick six. We throw a pick six. That's the pick we're six up. game. We throw a pick six, and they tied up the game because instead of us just running the ball um, and getting the first down, which he had been doing the entire game, mm -hmm. we throw a pick six. And from that point on, Everything went down here. We kept throwing pick six. We kept right, getting guys. Like, he got yeah. kept getting yeah. hurt. That kept was the end hurt. of certain careers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, not well, in, nah, not but the uh, end of the career here. But yeah. like my guy Shabby is still in the league. He's still playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's still playing. Didn't he, he get playing. a ring? 
Nah, he nah, should have. Hey. If Tom Brady, twenty-eight to three, <laughs> 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 yeah. um, he sure did go back to that, huh? Yeah, but uh, yeah, man, like you know, we we lost. I think Cushion that year. We lost Arian that that year. We we lost a bunch of guys. We lost our coach that year. Like Kubiak. Yeah, yeah. Like start having heart trade. Start having yes, trouble. Yes, yes, yes. You know, we were up by. I think three touchdowns going in halftime, he collapsed. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. everything, like basically the way I look at that season, it was like, hey, certain people had to leave. Right. Like certain people wasn't supposed to be here in Houston no more. So they, yeah. had, they had to go yeah. wrong so they could go where they were supposed to go. Of course. And certain people were supposed to come here, and that's why that happened. Yeah. Because, like I said, we had a – people was – we was – Talked about as being one of the yeah. teams that were going to be I in remember. the Super Bowl contention going right. into that season. Right. You know what I mean? But, like, I blew my knee out. I didn't blow it out, but I had to I, – I, I tore, like, my meniscus and stuff up uh, in that training camp and had to fight to get back in time to play week one. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't the same guy out there. We had a bunch of key injuries. Um, but, yeah, man, everything went wrong. And – but for the most part, when you get seasons like that, right. it has to do something like that. You have a really bad quarterback or you have really bad quarterback play. Right. And then you have a bunch of injuries and you have, you know, our scheme was legit. Uh -huh. Offense and defense. Yeah. But we had a lot of key injuries. Our quarterback didn't play anywhere near as good yeah. as he had been playing it's his ability, entire right. career. Right. Um, so those just and we had being outliers, basically. It's yeah, just no kinda, question. You're living in it, which sucks, but it's yeah. just kind of. Because think about the next year, the Texans man. went what, like nine and seven? Yeah. You know what I mean? It was pretty much with, with Bill 60, yeah. not like 70% of the same guys on the team. Right. You know what I mean? It ain't like Bill O'Brien's offensive scheme is something spectacular because it's not. You see, not, over the years, you don't get that. us started on yeah. Bill O'Brien. That's, but, that's you know. coming up. Don't worry. Well, <laughs> well, 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 okay. Now, when somebody like Matt Schaub's going through something like that, that's yeah, with the pick sixes and and and, and mentally, right? Um, you're lying. You know, and 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 he's uh, obviously there's something going on because that's not the player he was. Right. First off, what do you as teammates? Do you try to do anything or talk to him or anything to try to pick him up? And and what do you think that is when because we've seen that in baseball you see it a lot. Right. I remember when Mark Waller it was that wasn't Mark Waller's no, it was uh, Chuck Knobloch. No, well Chuck Knobloch he couldn't throw the ball from second base Ankeel. to first base. Rick, Rick Ankiel Ankeel. couldn't get <laughs> right. the ball over the plate, and Schaub was just every week, just now Markel Fultz. Yeah, right. He, he had like I think he had like five or six games in a row that he had yes. pick six. six. Well, I'm a, see, the thing about it was is you got to understand that Shab was the guy. Yeah, and he had, been, he had performed at a high level Absolutely. for Very an extended high. period of time. A lot of people from Houston, a lot of times I hear people fans talk about Matt Schaub, and they forget about the fact that this cat used to, he used to do numbers. Yards. Yeah, no question. No, he you know, did throw 5,000 5, yards. Almost threw you know, for 6,000 yards. Like 500, I think it was 521 yards mm -hmm. in the game uh, yeah. against the Redskins. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Everybody thinks talks about that whole uh, Andre Johnson where he, he scored a touchdown at the end of the game and spiked the ball, that, that iconic photo. Mm -hmm. But in that game, Shabby had like 521. Yards, 21 yards passing so right. mm -hmm. you know that was the guy that you know we went to through wars and battles together so you just expected it like you know he's not going to keep making the same mistakes right. and it wasn't the same thing it wasn't like they're running the same routes it was just it was it was yeah. tough man and he you know he would come into you know we'd have players only meetings to try to write the ship and you know he's basically taking all of the the blame on himself but we had a lot of veteran guys on that team, and so we tried to, of course, the veteran guys would try to take it upon themselves to try to do better. Like, the first thing you got to do is always look in the mirror um, to make a difference, just to see, like, if we're going to – what we got to do to right the ship. And so I always looked at myself first, um, and that a lot of guys on the team did. It was never a situation where I just looked at – uh, shop and just like, man, you know, you need to get out of here. Or because it, it, you know, certain certain guys or certain teammates you might have that don't put in the work and don't, you know, you can tell the reason why they're having, you know, they're not playing well is because they're not putting enough into it. They're mm -hmm. not all in. That's a totally different thing than what Shab was. He was just a guy that was putting everything into it, but he was having bad luck and he was making bad decisions. And, you know, it was costing us. Right. But that's still my – still it always was my guy and I always be, be my guy. You exactly. know what I mean? So um, it was a tough situation. And, and if we had the answers, we would have we would have we would have solved the problem and right. it wouldn't have went the way it went. So right. you know, it was a very tough situation. Did you ever have a situation where you just couldn't get your blocking scheme down? Or anything mentally for you that, that that's akin to that? No, nah, man. Okay. Like I was, I was always a. Uh, I, I don't think you can really compare the two. Like, okay. 
as far as like degree of difficulty, as far as blocking schemes and then quarterbacks having to deal with, um, you know, making sure the receivers are running the route at the correct depth, corn, uh, dealing with coverages, dealing with people in their face, uh, you know, avoiding pass pressure is different. You know, I've had I've had rough outings, but I've never strung together like a bunch of rough outings like gotcha. that. So I, I've never been in that position. Nah. Okay. He couldn't find himself out of his way out of the matrix, bro. Like it was tough. Yeah. Uh, tough. All right, I got a question. Since you played for the Dolphins and the Jets, and they were at one time a storied franchise, right? How trash are they really as an organization? Uh, trash, just how dysfunctional. Uh, is same, much better way yeah, to put. like they they seem like they both of them seem like they cannot get out their way for I, that I, for that division. Especially, yeah, head. because I mean, you got to look at it. The stuff that's going on now with Adam Gase and <laughs> you know, uh, I can't pronounce the, the yeah, GM's coach yeah. McCallahan or whatever his name was, but you know that whole ordeal. You just saw, saw it in the introductory press conference. You could tell that they was like Adam Gates looked like he was on something, man. Yeah, my like son, he looked like he he, he, he he was tweaking off of something, man. <laughs> but he ended up winning the, the power struggle, yeah. and that happens with organizations. There's um, everything is about control, and that's anything in big 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 business, and that's all it is is a big business and. Um, you know what's going on there, Miami. They haven't. They've struggled for an extended period of time. Part of the struggles is the fact that they're dealing with New England. But um, you, you would think that they would kind of try to adapt some of their policies and, and kind of function like them. And I think that's what the Dolphins are doing by hiring, hiring uh, yeah. Brian yeah. Flores. You know, he's a he is a New England guy. Okay. Um, and, and maybe it'll maybe it'll translate to them being having some more success in the future. But um, it's going to be tough this year. I don't, you know, quarterback situation. I wouldn't be too excited about it. I'm right. not, I mean, I, I think the Jets and the Dolphins, both teams, are going to be like, you know, four to six weeks win teams max oh, wow. this year. But there's um, never even like a consistent second in that division. That's yeah. What led, and then yeah. you compare them to, like you say, maybe the best organization in sports, and it just looks like they're literally little kids, and it's for 15 years now. Yeah. I mean, there's. How do you get out of it? Like who's they got to sell the team? Is that the only? Well, I don't think they even have the same ownership. They definitely have the same yeah, ownership yeah, from when I was there. Um, you know. <laughs> that makes it work. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just bad out there just because I think that, you know how like Bill O'Brien and, and Brian Gain, they talk about alignment. Mm -hmm. and they talk about, you know, basically, like I mentioned earlier with organizations, you have to be on the same page as far as your coaching. And your your management, as far as acquiring talent, bringing guys in here that fit what you want to do. And first of all, you have to make sure that what you want to do is it works in the league, a successful thing. Um, you got to be able to to choose talent. Like you got to be able to draft well. The Dolphins really haven't drafted well in a long time. Like the, the last times I think the the Jets had a really good draft was like the first year I was with the Jets. That was in 2006. They they, they drafted. The Brickershaw Ferguson, oh, um, yeah. Nick Mangold, uh -huh. and Darrell Revis. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. All that same year. Staples, uh, uh, yeah. David Harris. Yes. All those cats came out the same year. Uh -huh. That was a great draft for, for the Jets. Yeah. But since then, you know, I can't think of the Jets having a, a really good draft class. And so you can't you can't function if you're not continually reloading cheap talent. You know what I mean? That's something that New England does a great job mm -hmm. of, is they do a great job of acquiring talent. At a at a discount rate, right? And, and a people lot of think, times, like you said, cheap talent. They think cheap meaning it can't play. It's not nah, any good. No, nah. it's, you get but players take, at, yeah. at a minimum. Yeah. At, but at people a, will take pay cuts to go to an organization no like that. You have to have an organization that will attract people like that. And, okay. and guys and don't like playing up there. Really, they don't like it up there. They don't. They know they're gonna win up there. Yeah, they don't like. The, the the vibe when they're I there. know what Boston you know what I mean yeah. they don't like sure. the vibe not, not even yeah, just the city but I'm uh, talking about when you go into no fun, the yeah. locker room it's like you know it's not a a, a fun jo jovial type yeah. atmosphere I'm sure I Flash remember, Gordon like, was like what in the <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but like okay. uh, Lane Johnson was talking about you know the right tackle for the Eagles he was like man I'd rather win my one championship yeah, here he as, a, as, a go, as opposed to being in New England and having to deal with what they have to deal with up there because Everybody that leaves there, they they know what it is. It's just it's just like there's a lot of uh, babying. There's a lot of micromanaging to make sure that guys do what they're supposed to do. Okay. I was always a big fan of. I'm a veteran. Um, 
I'm responsible. Right. So you're going to give me, it's even like in college, they're going to give you the assignment. You're expected to do the work. We're not finna call you and make sure you do what you're supposed right. to do and keep you I'm here. I'm not at the, calling at the you facility. every night to make sure you're doing your homework. Exactly. Right, or keep you at the facility an extended period of time just so we can make sure you do what you're supposed to be doing. Um, like I said, there's benefits to that, but there's also like, you know, people are grown men, like yeah, people who have, have families, families and stuff like that. And so it takes a toll on that way. But man, it, um, especially if you want to win, there's a lot of guys that will take less money to go there, get their championship and then leave the next year. Uh, there's an outside linebacker that just did it this past year. I can't think of his name right now. Um, uh, I, know you're I can't think of his name right now, but he was a, like a defensive end outside linebacker type cat that went up there, signed like a one-year deal, got a Super Bowl championship, and then, as a matter of fact, he had a two-year deal, I think, and he asked them to release him. Yeah. Because he wanted to get up out of there. He got his ring. He was ready to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, I got but, my ring. But, that's my incentives. Right yeah. There. But they have a genius running the show, yeah. and everybody's going to fall in line to what he says. Bill Belichick everything even he is the coach and the general manager at the same time mm -hmm. so if you have a genius he, there's no way he could not be in alignment because he's the same person right. you know what i mean it's not two different opinions but everybody falls in line and he's an evil genius and so he's going to always be in a position to be oh, successful so many ways yeah, we can go with this i was gonna say tom and and, and yeah. bill again oh, yeah. yeah oh man you're Let's, listening to the garage apartment we're here each and every sunday night from six to seven central standard time be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website, thegarageapt.com. We have pro bowler Wade Smith with us. And founder of the Wade Smith Foundation. Absolutely. So now, you are done playing football. You have been blessed with an opportunity that many people in the world have not. But now you have started a new chapter. You have the Wade Smith Foundation. And I know one of the things that you were trying to tackle is is literacy. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your foundation, what you're trying to do. Uh, I see you have, what is it, reading? I don't want to say it wrong. Reading with? Reading with the pros. Reading with the pros. Yeah, you can hashtag that on, on Instagram, Twitter, yeah, and you, you'll see all, this, all okay. the stuff comes Absolutely. up. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit. But, yeah, so, okay. um, or trademark, excuse me, but. Yeah, the, Ray, the Wade Smith Foundation, I started in 2012, so I was here with the Texans still playing when okay. I started the foundation. Um, you know, our main focus is childhood literacy and education. Um, I was a kid that absolutely loved to read. Okay. I don't really have much as far as, you know, we wasn't traveling places. We mm -hmm. wasn't spending a lot of money because it wasn't there. But I could open a book absolutely. and I could become and go wherever I wanted to go. Absolutely. And so I, I loved reading. And so I, I, I knew that, you know, once I became established in the NFL and I had a contract in a situation where I could could uh, um, invest the time that you needed to start in the foundation, I know I wanted to do that. And so once I signed my deal here in Houston, I was like, all right, I'm ready to, to do that. And so I wanted to, to be something that I was passionate about myself. And so and I understood, like, how important that foundation it is for, for kids as far as literacy. You know what I mean? If you If you are – not reading at grade level by third grade. Some studies say third grade, some say fourth grade. Um, you're literally attacking life with one one hand, two hands behind your back. Right. You have, I, I want to say the numbers the last I saw was it's like, um, like 60, 60, 65 or 70 percent of all um, mm -hmm. inmates in prison could not read at grade level by third grade. Yeah, I've seen that same right. thing. And so. That's why I focus my attention on elementary school age kids and talking to them about the importance of reading, how cool it is, how it opens their mind to so many different opportunities because I want to see um, kids grow up and be successes. Like I, I grew up and I lived out my dream, you right. know what I mean? So now I'm just trying to create opportunities for others um, to live out their dream. And, you know, with Reading with the Pros, what we do is we get current and former NFL guys, we'll get um, radio disc jockeys, we'll get TV reporters, we'll get um, – We'll get uh, policemen, firemen. We'll get professionals, businessmen, uh, restauranteurs. Just we'll get professionals in all different realms, um, and we go to the schools and we'll have like a panel. Like we'll we'll do an assembly with the older kids in the schools, so third, fourth, fifth graders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes elementaries have sixth grades, but we we talk to them about the importance of reading. Then we do um, a Q and A with them, and the reason we do that is because I want the kids to be able to look at everybody up there on that stage and be like, man, that person, like, 
I want to be like that person on on stage, right. and that person was just like me. Right. So it so we get to eye level to where we're not talking down to them. We're talking to them eye to eye and, and letting them know that they very well could be up on this stage too. That's kind of one of the challenges that I give to the kids. Like, hey, you know, um, there's no reason why you cannot be up here or be whatever you want to be in life, whether that's a football player or, you know, a doctor, lawyer, you know, TV reporter, DJ, whatever it is. And I have a lot of support in the city from a lot of celebrities in the city that helped me do the program. And I wouldn't be able to do it without them. But, like, it was funny the other day I was listening to some on the radio. I forgot what station I was listening to. But there's some there's some concert or something because I was half listening to it. There's some concert coming up coming up or some show. And it was like, yeah, uh, Bun B, Trade the Truth, Paul Wall. And I was like, man, all them cats are done reading with the pros. them all your people. Multiple right? times. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. So you got guys like that that do it and you have you know like a lot of the guys we talked about before Ian Foster yeah, exactly. Matt Shobbs yeah and, I saw you, you know say, like yeah. all these type of guys that have done reading with the pros and then you have it's been all over the world man like all over the country excuse me like Jordan Sparks Chrisette Michelle like okay. there's a whole bunch of different people that are celebrities that um you know help spread that message they choose where they where they go or you you like Filtered for staying in Houston or just so people can inv ask you to come out or how does that work? So basically what it is is um, I would say 99% of the schools that we go to are Title One schools. Okay. Um, so we, we, yeah, in, in Title One, if, if y'all are listening and you don't know what that means, it just, it means that there's a certain percentage, usually like 85% of the kids at that school are on free or reduced lunch. Right. right. And so, you know, those are kids that are in a lower social economic situation. And so we try to bridge the gap because mm -hmm. there's a, there's a need there. And so we go where the need is. Um, right. We have gone to other elementary schools and usually that's, you know, somebody reaching out. Um, mm -hmm. But 99% of the time it's those type of schools and those kids and I try to do a, a really good job of getting people that have come there that the kids that I'm going to see identify with I want them to see somebody that looks right, like right. them right, that's right. experienced with the experience so they can understand it like cause a lot of times kids man they and that's just people in general you go off what you see you know what I mean? If so, if you see everything around you is a certain way, you think that's the way things are, and exactly. that's the way it has to be. You don't have right. to be that way. Right. right. You know what I mean? And so, um, that's why I was telling y'all earlier, um, before we started the show, about me growing up in Lake Highlands was the best thing that I could have been because even though I lived in apartments, and I didn't really have much, you know, I had friends that lived in nice houses. Right. And I was like, man, I wanted to, I want to, I want to live like Inspiring. this. You know, right. I, I, like, you know, y'all, y'all saw the thing the other day when uh, LeBron James was talking about, he, he saw his friend had a pantry. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? He was like, man, I didn't know what a pantry was. So I went to my phone. I got to yeah. high school. Right. Like, yeah, like that was when he said that I was like, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. but then it was like, man, I want me a pantry. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? What, what do I got to do to get a pantry? Yeah. Well, Make sure you handle your business in, 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 in the classroom. Absolutely. Because education is the greatest equalizer. It, it, it can level the playing field for any and everybody if you put enough into it. And so that's what I communicate with kids when I go to the schools. Yeah, I had a similar experience, too, in school. I, I remember not – I was like, oh, okay, so, yeah, we had – we kind of broke. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your daddy do? <laughs> yeah. So now, yeah. you have also written a book. You're an author. Two. Two books. Two Absolutely. Books, yeah, yeah. So how does what 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 made you decide to write a book? Um, I always wanted to do it since I was younger, since I was a little kid. Cause like I said, I used to read all the time. I used to write little short stories or whatever. Um, I always wanted to write a book, but, you know, I went to college and, and NFL and it kind of just went out to the back burner or whatever. But um, towards the end of my career, oh, I guess it was probably 2015, 16. Um, there was a local author here that approached me and she was like, you know what, we should write a book together, a children's book. And I was like, you know what, I've been wanting to do that, we should. And so um, basically we sat down and we wrote Smitty Hits the Playbooks. That right. was the first book um, in the Smitty book series. Um, so we did that book, I believe it was in 16 or 17. It might have been 17 when it came out. Um, it was 16. Time passing on me fast, and, 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 and <laughs> so like, but uh, the next year we did, I did myself. Um, the first book was co-written myself and Jamie Lamb, who's a local uh, author. Um, and then the second book I did myself, Smitty, uh, Smitty tackles bullying. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Okay. And so basically the Smitty book series is just, it follows the life of Smitty, who's like a um, third, fourth grader. Um, and him and his experiences that he's went through, he goes through in life and how he handles them. Um, and it's a fun, it, it's a fun book, you know, a lot of really good feedback on it from, from kids. And it's a really good tool to have when I go to these elementary schools, when I'm talking to them about the importance of reading. And then it's like taking yeah, the next step. And now we're not just reading, let's write our own books, right. you know, write our own stories. Absolutely. And being able to, you know, just put those, put those ideas and those thoughts in kids' minds planting those seeds and letting them grow you know what i mean and a lot of times it's powerful man it's a it's a really good feeling to know like i might go to a school um in 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 uh september or something like that and come back and visit them again maybe three or four months later and a kid was like come up to you and be like yeah after you came i wrote like this story and right, i turned right. it in and oh, won man. and won this writing contest that's and all nice. that's gotta be, yeah that's, that's gotta be a amazing. great feeling it's man. a great feeling man and it's that's mining what... talent from places that you know you normally wouldn't get i mean you might go find the next stephen king or somebody at one of those little schools in the or hood jordan you know? peele yeah or, or anybody I say, why yeah. Yeah. stephen king yeah. Yeah. stephen king's a prolific yeah. writer what you talking about <laughs> <laughs> Why can't be uh, uh, hey, H.S. Howard Greeley or something? It all works. Stephen King made a hundred million dollars. Alex Haley. Yeah. Alex <laughs> Haley, too. Okay. So now, which is harder? Writing a book say, or blocking the white friendly? Or somebody else out there? Which one is harder? Uh... Blocking Dwight Freeney was definitely harder than writing. <laughs> no question of that. There's a, there's a bunch of guys walking around the earth that could attest to that. A, a lot of times in my stories, man, like a lot of it is just based off of experiences that I. It's, it's very easy to tell a story that you lived through. Um, I feel like, and, and maybe that's not true for everybody. For me, it's not difficult to do. And then taking, you know, probably a, a basic premise of something, and then using your imagination to create off of a, a basic principle or an idea so um yeah definitely was easier to, to to block i mean excuse me definitely easier to write a book as opposed to to block and freeney but the process of writing a book is definitely longer you know what i mean um than than dwight freeney because you know it's one game and it's over with right. when's the next one coming out quicker it's a great question man so um it was supposed to be coming out last year mm -hmm. and it didn't come out last year because everything got delayed when Harvey hit. Right. Everything yeah, like got dang. backed up, backed mm -hmm. up, and I'm trying to catch up. Right. Um, but the book, the third book, is probably sixty percent done. Okay. Um, but problem is, is I have four kids. <laughs> <laughs> Radio show. No, I understand. Uh, we understand. You got a life. Yeah, you know, we're learning, we're learning that's the whole I was like, right right this week has been rough for us yeah, this week. So, yeah, yeah, trust me, we know, man. But, we have took a few on the chin this week. Yeah, but I, I'm, I try. Usually what happens is, is we do a family vacation every year. And the first two years, I finished both of my books while I was on my family vacation. We go, um, we go to Mexico every year. Okay. And so, and it's a week. And so this year, you know, we just scheduled it. And so uh, um, this summer... Hopefully during that week I can finish the book. That's my goal to finish the book then. And then if I can finish it in the summer, then it'll probably be out and ready to go by the beginning of 2020. So, oh, man. But yeah, look for that, people. Look Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. Man, we had to leave it there, man. We told you that hour flies by. I got so many questions yeah, so to many. ask you, man. Hey, hey, hey. Hopefully you could be a returning guest. Absolutely, you know so we we'll definitely schedule. have to have you back. Yeah, so you can, we can have you back, even football uh, during football season. You know, absolutely. We are talking to pro bowler, Arthur, uh, CEO, uh, founder, always act, Houston Texas community man. Com <laughs> motivator, educator, all of those things. Mr. Wade Smith, former pro bowler, Houston Texan, Miami Dolphin, New York Jet, Seattle Seahawks, great. Great <laughs> Memphis Texas. Tiger, uh, Lake Highlands, what is their mascot? I don't know what the they are. Wildcats, Wildcats. Wildcats. Already. 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 Dallas, Already. Texas, holding Already. it down, man. Texas As always, man, you're listening right. to the Garage Department. We are here each and every Sunday night from 6 to 7 Central Standard Time. Be sure to check us out on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our website. We got some great articles on there. We're going to probably put some, a few clips of this. Um, of course, those of you who can't catch it live, 
Um, as always, man, y'all have a wonderful, blessed week. Be good. Happy you birthday, birthday to good. my wife. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy uh, birthday, happy sister birthday Love. to my wife as well. There happy you go. anniversary to that boy, D.R.C. and Kimberly. Absolutely. Bro. Absolutely. So now, be good. If you can't be good, then be good at it. Y'all stay blessed. Follow the Garage Apartment on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Brand new tweets, photos, videos, chats. Let me show you something real quick. Follow me on social media. And subscribe to the Garage Apartment Radio on YouTube.